Okay, David, take the mic. Okay, um, good afternoon, sir. Good, good afternoon, class. Welcome. Um, okay, the first and we, the first and basic thing which um, um, I see as what I took from the last class is the fact that um, quality quality in this sense cannot be determined by me, by the um, organization. It has to be determined by the client. And as much as having said that, we can't just leave everything 100% to them. Because I remember you mentioned that, okay, it is one thing for them to say, okay, this is what we want. It is another thing to realize and confirm whether those things they want conform to protocol, conform to standards and all of that, that, that. The only time we need to maybe um, try and wrestle or maybe not say wrestle, maybe question their choice is when it goes against protocol, against standards and all that. So um, I, have been, I, I came out with a lot, but let me just put it, leave it there, let others also. Uh, Thank you. And I need to qualify um, the statements you made about um, the, the, the time or the exception when you may have to um, prompt, point, correct a customer. That's only when it goes below the regulatory compliance, the yes. building code, right? If it is not breaking a law or a, a regulation of government or a published acceptable standard of the um, organization that you serve, for example, then that is the customer's standard. So the lowest level of quality acceptable is the one admissible by law, acceptable by law, which is regulatory standard according to the building code and all other regulatory agencies the government brings, right? The next level is the level of the corporate standard. So if a organization has set up its own standard for doing things, you as an FM become the advisor of that standard people in the organization. So you don't, you don't, uh, you don't uh, um, uh, uh, want to operate below what that standard or that regulatory uh, requirement has become, okay? But everything above that is, is the client's or uh, user's uh, discretion, okay? All right, thank you very much for that, David. I need more videos on because you all speak. The class is it's a small class today, so everybody's video should be on so you can speak, okay? Fatima, let's hear from you. Paul, can I talk later, please? I'm responding to an email. Okay, I just no want problem. to put my thoughts together. All right, that's Thank fine. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Theodora, take her place. You're muted. You're muted. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So my big take home is the um, the question you asked when you said um, who determines quality, customer, uh -huh. and um, customer and customer and customer, except on, on the point at the point where it's against regulation. So yes. and uh, that's my take home. Okay. Can, Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. Well, I mean. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. Yeah, I also learned about uh, the what quality actually is. Um, just like we, you mentioned that um, quality has to do with the 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 satisfaction of the customer and um, how customer perceived um, the service is being uh, rendered by a facility organization. I also um, learned 
some things about um, um, standardized tasks, especially those um, um, the standard from um, from Toyota. The one you mentioned, um, how they were able to maintain the leadership in the um, vehicle industry. So their philosophy terms and um, how they're able to develop a, a standard task. Um, also, how they were able to make decision, I mean, slowly. How they, I mean, their principle, let me just put it that, that way, quality management uh, principle. Yeah. How it governs how they operate and then help them to maintain the leadership among others. That you have to have a standard task that once you are carrying out your task according to what is um, has been described, you can only have that standard as your minimum. You can only improve on it. You can't go below it. So that will keep the quality of the organization in a, in a perfect shape to ensure that they don't uh, lose. Um, and then I also learned about benchmarking. Mm -hmm. In FM, right. though I've known some things about it before, but I was also able to learn some things more about um, how it is that um, we can look at a very good quality from a similar organization and then benchmark against it, work towards that, and then achieve the same thing. Uh, that is, is not, it's not that, that is a kind something that every FM should work towards. So, very Those good. are part of the things that I took home. And then also the effect of uh, uh, the external and internal factors that can affect qualities. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 I mean, things that has to do with things within the organization and then those ones that you cannot control, but you mm -hmm. just need to minimize the effect as much as possible. Exactly. So those are the things that I took home. Okay, thank you Thanks. very much. That's very good. Thank you. Lucy. Lucy, let's hear from you. Okay, my take home from that class was then two, three points from the the first thing um, is to um, among people. The second thing is to um, not, some people should not see themselves as being indispensable because when that happens, there's going to be a problem. So when people, when you see people that are looking at themselves as being indispensable, um, like Mr. Paul said, you will, try and do away as much as possible with that person. Yeah. And the third thing is um, we should challenge ourselves and others to learn more every day. So yeah. as to keep it better. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lucy. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So um, I guess those are the people that want to speak because those are the only faces I've seen in class. If I don't see your face in class, it means you are not here. Marita La, let's hear from you. Welcome to class. <laughs> let's hear your takeaway. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, my different perception to quality. And what customer A might see as quality might not be what customer B sees as quality. You give an example that maybe you go to an office by 10 p.m. or before 10, the customer might be impressed that you are always coming before 10, before shedding. And when you are doing the same to another customer, it might get angry and like, why are you always coming before 10 and all that? And another thing I learned is there's difference between quality and grade. You know, grade is sometimes about the material and quality is about customer satisfaction and high grade does not directly mean high quality. So that was my leader to give you. Super, thank you. 
Thank you so, so much. I like that uh, takeaway. I couldn't have done it better. Well done, uh, Mutala. Well done. Okay, who's there? Lawa, do you want to speak? I'm seeing you're stealing, not your face. Okay, Anna, let's hear from you. Give us a takeaway from last class. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, class. Welcome. Okay. My takeaway from the last class as on um, quality management. Uh, we said that uh, the customer is the center of quality. And that uh, the customer is um, the core of quality. Yeah. The customer is the only one that can define what quality means. Very good. Uh, mm -hmm. You do not uh, impose your perception on quality on customer. Allow the customer to judge. Thank you. Thank because you. your own perception of quality may not be what the customer wants. Exactly. Thank you. Fantastic. Then, okay. Then the number one priority of customer of quality is to understand your customer. Mm -hmm. You understand what the customer wants. Ask further questions as to what the customer wants. Very good. Then by the time you give the right input, you will get the right output. Fantastic. If the input is faulty, the output will be faulty. Super, super. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, Fatima, let's hear from you now. Yes. Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon. My key takeaway from last week's class is almost the same as all other speakers. However, it's, it tells me how central the end users of what my service is to the service I'm rendering, how I have to deal with my client. That's the end user. Yeah. It's my key takeaway. Because so, Paul, as I told you earlier, me, I'm deep into this. I just wish this, this entire exercise is like three months before now. <laughs> because as I speak, even suffering now to, to to respond to a mail from a yeah. contractor. Yes. I just can't believe <laughs> if I got all these techniques today. Yeah. And, you know, it, it gives me, I remember the, 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 the meeting I attended before sending this mail that the engineer is responding to me. Mm -hmm. I was there after the opening of this branch. I think I've done everything good, everything sleepless nights. And guess what? The lady, the branch manager, mm -hmm. shouting at that conference, this is that, that is this. <laughs> I just, that courage I took that day, everybody was amazed during that meeting, eh? To say, ah, Fatima is not talking. After that class, I don't see myself talking. <laughs> After that, your point, I just don't see myself saying anything because she's the end users, yes. user and is what I think it's best, mm -hmm. but it's not good for her. Yeah. So <laughs> Super. I'm learning. I'm seriously learning. The, Very anyway, good. That's my takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And 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 uh, I would really appreciate um, everybody in this class to take time off to do a one minute, two minutes, three minutes video of significant lessons you're learning. We need to. We need to, you know, spread the word to other people who are, you know, languishing in their careers for years, you know, and, you know, hanging on to things they think is right, you know, and, you know, there may even be an environment where people are even hailing you, cheering you on. You are right. You are right. Shut back at the customer. I can't take that from a customer. And what do they think they are, you know? So, so as you learn things, as you apply them and impact your, your career, make some of these little two uh, uh, short clips and send to us. So we can use that to encourage others to join the FM Mastercraft and you know, blow the FM you know, campaign it. People should really hear what they should be doing. And within the next five years, the FM industry will become very big, very big, because we would have helped people to learn what they should be learning and doing correctly in the industry. So thank you very much, Fatima, for that. Uh, 
uh, who was supposed to speak next? I do want to say something. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I've heard a lot of people talking about quality management and um, the customer. I didn't hear anybody talk about service level agreements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think um, that's one thing that um, you have to understand is quite important in our business. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I say so is that it, it checkmates everybody. Yeah. When you have a service level agreement, the basis of it is to document the services that are going to be offered to the end user at the end of the day. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Now, once that is documented, documented, it becomes a binding document between yourselves and the end user. So anybody, everybody becomes accountable to it. Yeah. So if I'm failing on my part as a service provider, yeah. I can be put in check. I can, my, my, my non-performance can be checked. Yeah, sure. Things can be escalated. Mm -hmm. And then you find your way to improve on the services, you know, on, on that aspect. And then the same thing, if the end user is not complying to what you have agreed in that document, yeah. you can always tell them, look, oh, this is what we agreed at the end of the day. Yeah. You're not living up to your mm -hmm. bargain. I mean, if it also comes down to budget or monetary things, you can always do a plus or minus. That's mm -hmm. always what that agreement is all about. Yeah. And it's key. And yeah. I think we should also try and get into the habit of doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I have some facilities where we have gone into service level agreements and there are some we don't. The reason why some of them we don't do that, it's because we've already identified the services that we're going to offer and agree on them. Hmm. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Yeah, we sure, already sure. have it itemized yes. and it's agreed. Yes. And whereas some we actually document it together mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. this is our service level agreement. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. sort of like works in two ways. Yeah, I think that's just what I want to talk about. But well done to everyone else. Thank you. Fantastic. And <laughs> when we say understand your customer, document your understanding using metrics and standards and define the gap and improve in your performance. Service level agreement is the documentation for the whole process. If your customer says, I want this. How do you document what the customer wants against what you are going to provide? That's the document that puts all of this together. So thank you very much for that. All right, let me hear from Ansem, one minute, and Daniel, one minute, and we'll move on to the class for today. Um, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, okay, um, in the last class, uh, I, I got to know much on KPI. Okay. Very good. Now the network, is network is having some issues. KPI. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Daniel. I will just put off your video for now. Go on. Okay. Okay. I should go on. Yes, go on, please. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, uh, KPI, uh, which is, um, um, I, I got to uh, know much about, um, in detail, about KPI in the last class, well, which I look at it from what I have digested from that is more, is focus on, um, on the organization. Okay. You know, that is, it talks about um, how profitable, and all that uh, the organization will be, uh, whether it's actually on the right track or not, or that has to do with the, the object, the company objective. Mm -hmm. You know, that is what um, I was able to grasp from the, the last class. Very good, very good. Yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I think Ansem dropped off, uh, the video is off. Um, I'm going to hand you back over to the structure for today, Actor Osega is already here. Um, I the last class I was, uh, Mr. Osi, are you there? The last class I was with you, we couldn't see eye to eye, so that you could do introduction. But I believe you had another class or even two. Um, 
beyond that one, and I believe you must have done a proper introduction to the class, and they know you now, right? Yes, I've done that, Paul. I'm here. Okay, fantastic. All right. So but we've not I'm seen going. his face. It's all see. They said they have not seen your face. So. We've not seen him like what is his picture? <laughs> <laughs> they are two different things. <laughs> because for my son is wrong. Do you want to yeah. Do you want to operate like Holy Spirit? We don't want Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we, we don't assume who he is. Is that we, we, we should take it like that this time, Abi? No, I don't see my face, but let's concentrate on the class now. Okay. 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 Mr. Elsie says we should uh, concentrate on the class. Learn from the holy, holy um, ghost mode OCA behind for now. And at the opportune time, if if we all qualify one day, I'm sure he will show his face, manifest himself in glory. <laughs> <laughs> on Pentecost Day, he will come. <laughs> is that you welcome, man? Eh? Your class is yours. All right, thank you. I'm trying to share my screen now, but I don't have access. Oh, sorry. I, I was supposed to make you a co-host. I did that before. I think you dropped off at some point or something. I didn't know. Okay, try. Yeah. Can you remove me as a person so you will not be disturbing my camera for here? Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Your screen is clear now. So enjoy your class, guys. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, good evening, all. Um, um, and welcome to class. I hope you can hear me. Loud and clear. Great. Awesome. Um, today we'll be looking at um, building fabric and uh, structural maintenance, building fabric and structural maintenance. And uh, we'll be looking at this under the following heading. We'll look at foundations, we'll look at walls, we'll look at ceilings, we'll look at roof, we'll look at floors, we'll look at uh, windows, we'll look at doors. Anyway, these are the different components of a building. And uh, it's very important for us to note that uh, 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 for you as, as, as a facility manager, you must understand the different components of a building. Uh, like it's often said, I don't know if it's been mentioned in this class before that the facility manager is the jack of all trades and master of all, not the normal jack of all trades, master of none. You are the master of all because you are supposed to make a bit of everything uh, in a building and uh, know how to manage the building as well. Because if you do not understand the different aspects of a building, how do you manage it in the first place? And your, your, your principal, um, uh, what you really do as a facility manager is actually manage the building and the facility which uh, you are supposed to be in. So it's very important for you to know the different parts of the building and the makeup of the building. And that's why we are looking looking at uh, this uh, today uh, so that you'll be able to student maintenance is essential to prolong the building life cycle and reduce the company's loss. When buildings are neglected, defects can occur, which may result in extensive and unavoidable damage to the building fabric or structure in itself. It is not only the building that suffers the loss, the inheritance of the building um, are also exposed to great danger. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes, I, I don't know if um, any of you at any point in time um, being into an abandoned Let's say you have a, 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 like, I know a lot of people that are in Lagos now, not from Lagos, they're not Lagosians, and they have, um, uh, uh, what's it called? They have um, uh, buildings in their, in their villages, in their homes at home, and from time to time, especially for our brothers from East, they only go at least once in a year, towards the end of the year, and um, I, I want to just ask this open question before I continue. For, for 
or just take two or three response. When you get home, after you travel uh, for, for during the Christmas period, for those of us in class, I'll just take three responses. What do you notice? What do you notice? Um, let's see who I'll take. Let's hear from Fatima. Okay, Fatima, are you, do you travel? Yes, I do. Okay, so what do you notice, Fatima? Coming from the village into my... Once you travel from Lagos to, to your village, the house, when you get to your house in the village, what do you notice? Oh, I can't place... I notice a lot of things. By the way, I'm in Sierra Leone. Okay, so... so... From going down to Makeni. Okay, tell me. What do you notice? No, just say, just there's, there's no correct or wrong answer. It's just, I, it's just noticed, a... I noticed the entrance of my house. Okay, what do you notice on the entrance of the house? Um, one of the first things you notice is that it's dusty, right? Yes, I think it's not well kept because I'm not around. So you're not around. What else do you notice when you get into the building? Let's take mm -hmm. you as that one. <laughs> uh, let, uh, who would I take now? Uh, uh, who will be able to? Uh, let's see who's active here. Theodora. Yeah. So, what do you notice, Mark? I notice a lot of cobwebs. Cobwebs are here. What else? Um, then some, some doors are. Oh, look at it. It's difficult to open. Great, 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 great. That's one. Yeah. Okay. The same thing, and then, um, uh, uh, well, I can see your hand. So, what do you notice? Yes, sir. Uh, she just said my my mind. Yeah, the padlock is uh, somehow stiff, uh, everywhere is dusty. The tables, you see cobwebs, you see uh, mosquitoes, ants. Uh, dead, dead ones book. and uh, all sort of things like that. Okay, great. Um, those are some of the few things we noticed. Uh, I, uh, just to continue now, um, really, one of the things you find out is that if you go inside the building completely, you discover that the building looks like it wants to start deteriorating. Am I correct? Sometimes look at the view. You may notice that sometimes you may even notice that the tiles on the floor um, in some areas may want to pull out. Uh, the doors begin to shrink. It's difficult to open. Uh, in some areas, the windows become stiffened, like you mentioned, where you have um, uh, iron uh, metal doors. Some of them get stiffened because of rust. Um, just a, a few other things uh, that you notice around the building. That happens because um, the building has been left with no activity. You know, and uh, sometimes it's always important for you to know that a building leaves itself, it breathes. You know, when you leave a, build, a building without any occupant inside the building for a long time, that building deteriorates faster. It deteriorates faster. That's why um, for, if you have, um, if, you are meant, if you are actually in a facility where you have like eight apartments or maybe 12 apartments and uh, out of the 12 apartments, you have four occupied. We, you discover that the other ones that are not occupied, every time you go in there, you notice that there's something that is defective. There's something that is falling out. Either the kitchen cabinet is trying to reset itself. And uh, one or two, compared to the same apartment that people are living in. And when you go into that apartment, you see that, okay, things are well organized because the movement of human beings inside that apartment has a way of making that apartment um, become um, livable, so to speak because your, the exchange of, the, of your, your body temperature in that space affects the total ambience of the space. And that's part of one of the things you must note as a, as a facility manager, because you must know that once a building is left for a long time, no matter how hard you try to maintain that building or to clean that building, each time you come in, there must always be one fault or the other. It's very important that you notice. Now, um, why am I saying this? Because it, it's at, at different points, at different time in, um, in, in as you manage a building, um, there are different things that are core to the building uh, fabric in itself. 
and you need to understand how this and how to manage it and knowing what exactly to do and getting the right professionals involved at the required time such that you'll be able to attend to the issues um, that uh, will come up at a particular time. Foundation. The foundation of a building is that part of the building or the structure that transmits the load of the building to the soil. Is that part of the structure that transport that transmits the load of the building to the soil? And we have different types of foundation. We have basically four types of foundation. We have the traditional foundation, which is called the strip foundation. We have the pad foundation. We have the raft foundation, and we have the pile foundation. Uh, these are the different types of foundation, and all these different types of foundation. Uh, they are used for specific or different types of buildings. And depending on it, the, what determines the foundation you use for a building is actually the load that is to be transmitted to the soil. A very light structure does not require very elaborate foundation. It just requires the traditional strip foundation. Strip foundation is that foundation that... Um, everybody should be used to uh, when you want to build a house one of the things you know is that you dig the ground to build the foundation you dig the ground you pour concrete on the ground which you call blinding and then you do the the foundation foot in concrete and then you start setting blocks up before you now do uh, the um, the floor slab which some persons call the German floor if you look at the diagram that is here uh, we have two major types of uh, chip foundation you have the traditional type. In fact, I think we have the traditional type, which is this one on the left that you see on the screen, and the other one on the right is called the deep strip foundation. Deep strip foundation is when the foundation foot, the concrete mass, is deep and is, uh, uh, is, is deeper than the regular one. Normally, once you where you have deep um, uh, strip foundation, is determined by the engineers because of the load, the load bearing capacity of the soil, and that determines the type of foundation you use at a particular time. The next one we have is what we call the pad foundation. Pad foundation are normally used for column footings. Column footings. Um, if you are used to um, street lights around where you live or where you stay or where you drive around, you see this concrete, this uh, cubic concrete um, stuff that the street lights sit on top. That concrete stuff, that cube concrete stuff is called a pad foundation because it's actually used for point load to direct the load directly down uh, to, the, to the soil. Uh, something like this shows that. And then the next one we have is the raft foundation. Raft foundation is used where uh, the load bearing capacity of the soil is very, very bad. And you, the raft foundation is actually done like a table. It's like you're placing a table or a plate on top of the soil so that it, it sits on top of the soil and not sink. And that's, that's where you have raft foundation. You see a typical, if you look at this picture on the bottom of this, let me try and see if I can expand it. It's something that a lot of us have seen, and uh, um, uh, you know that um, you have seen something like the drain construction, where the whole foundation itself is done in concrete, so that um, you'll be able to carry the load. Now, that is done in such a manner that the foundation sits in the soil. When the soil, bear, the load bearing capacity of the soil is very bad, especially in swampy areas. Um, where you need to just get to a point where the soil will be able to carry the, the foundation, but in such a manner where the, the, the stability of the soil at different points is not too strong. So you do you, you do the, the, um, the, the rough foundation, which is like a table on top of the soil to be able to carry the load that is coming on top. Then the next one is the pile foundation. Pile foundation is also used where the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, capacity of the soil is very bad. Uh, the soil has a very low bearing capacity. And then also have uh, 
the uh, very heavy structures coming on the building. Like um, pile is, if you have ever seen where bridges are being constructed, where bridges are constructed, those things that you see drilled into the ground, um, you see them doing the drilling into the ground to get to a very uh, stable point in the soil. Uh, pile, those piles, after you do the drilling of the piles, then you have what we call the pile cap before the column or the other structural element uh, come and sit on top of the pile. It's uh, very important for us to know that It's very important for us to know this. And sometimes you have a mixed blend of all these foundation types. You have a mix of um, a raft pile, you have a mix of pad and strip foundation at uh, different points in a building. Foundation, after foundation, the next step, after you have done the building foundation, the next thing you start doing is the walls. Walls is that part of a building, of a structure that defines an area and carries a load or provides shelter or security. Walls in a building, uh, in buildings uh, that, walls is that part of the building that forms the superstructure, the external and the interior separation of different parts of the building. The walls that you have um, in buildings uh, is, is, is actually uh, what you see. Normally a building that you see is made up of two parts. You have the superstructure and you have the substructure. The substructure is those things that happen under the ground. And those what, what you see in the, in the eyes from the soil level is called the superstructure. Superstructure is what is happen, that happens above the ground and um, for the substructure you can have you can have floors you can anything that goes uh, below the ground is called basement before you even get you can have like two three four five six floors of basement before you have the foundation and but all those things that happen under the ground is called substructure no matter what it is whether it is the basement whether it is the um, foundation or whatever happens is called the structure why anything that happens on top is called the superstructure. Now the walls form, most walls form the part of the superstructure and um, it's used to define space and walls are also used to transmit the load of the building also to the foundation. Um, foundation transmits from the building to the soil and the soil, uh, so the wall transmits from the building to the foundation. We have different types of walls. We have a um, load bearing walls I will have non load bearing walls load bearing walls are the walls that carry load that transmits the building load directly to the foundation and they are either internal or external walls non bearing not load bearing walls are walls that do not bear any form of load most of the time they are referred to as partition walls uh, where you have um, frame structures uh, where the building is built, having columns and beams standing. And then after the columns of beams of the building is standing, you now begin to see uh, the walls go up. Uh, and that's um, uh, not no bearing walls. We also have what we call party walls, other types of walls, including party walls. We have fire walls, we have share walls. Fire party walls are actually walls that just divide the spaces for insulation and for fire purposes. Then you have walls that are called special fire walls. The walls are built for fire resistance to spread fire uh, from uh, one point of uh, the building to the other. Most of the times, um, those kind of walls are built around server rooms and sometimes built around um, areas where if you have ovens in a, in a particular area of the building, uh, you do a firewall to prevent in case there's fire coming from um, where you have so much heat going to the other part. Why? Uh, share walls are built to uh, reinforce the building to withstand uh, wind effects and um, uh, probably effects from, um, from earthquakes where that happens. Uh, most times where you see share walls, share walls are normally on high-rise buildings. 
sometimes they put they look at the building after they look at the orientation of the wind the wind direction uh they position the shell wall at the point where the wind has um, a greater impact on the building so the shell wall sounds like a shield to be able to shield uh from um, um forming any form of damage to the building and also making the building stable um the movable partition walls we know that that's simple we have the cutting wall uh or building facade cutting walls are normally used uh for office building residential but um, all multi-layer buildings um to um see and ensure that um, the building looks good and they are normally done in glass uh, or in decorative and building finished material um we have a, a stock for us to see the already is uh, cutting walls are something that's becoming increasingly uh, um, popular these days. Um, we have types of wall finishes. We all have different finishes, and the wall finishes that we have uh, move from different types depending on the class or the uh, the type. What is agreed or built by uh, either the architect that design or the engineers. Uh, or the client, what they have, uh, the client actually agrees and then decides to put on the wall finishes. We have stained glass uh, finish that is normally found around in uh, churches, in religious um, uh, houses or religious homes, and then in, in, in some halls. We have flaking wall finish, as uh, it kind of looks as though uh, it's just pattern for, for they're just different types. You have the pebble finish. Um, those are done with pebble stones. Small, small pebbles are put together and then put on the walls as finish. You have the plaster cement finish, which is which is very popular, uh, where you have um, uh, the cement mortar, uh, or sand and water and cement mixed together with plaster sand, plaster to make the place um, look nice. You also have the marble wall finish, where you use marble stone and install it on the wall. You have the POP. Uh, finishes we know about POP the uh, um, uh, plaster of Paris. I also have wall tile cladding, and uh, those are a few finishes that you have. Uh, we also go into the different types of materials for walls. The very popular one is the brick, the brick walls. Uh, we have the plaster boards, we have brick, we have mortar, we have um, uh, plasters uh, that we use for materials for walls. Uh, sometimes you need to know all this material. So uh, when you are dealing with uh, different buildings, you know how the character of these materials work. Uh, for external wall materials, you have the metal cladding sheets, uh, which are stronger well, um, uh, weather resistance. You have the stone cladding, which we know. We also have the plastic cladding. Sorry. You also have the plastic cladding. Functions of the wall. Walls are meant... Um, to provide protection from weather and also allow for proper uh, demarcation of any given area or spaces. It gives barrier to sound and sound insulation. And it also uh, separates spaces in the of a building. It gives strength and stability to, uh, to buildings. It reduces spread of fire from one space to the other. It also gives a little bit of thermal insulation and provides security. And provides uh, security. Uh, those are just a few functions of the wall. Um, uh, planning. Um, normally, once you are maintaining any facility, one of the things you need to do uh, to check for the walls is uh, you need to do daily inspection. Thorough of walls you need to do daily inspection of walls uh just just the inspection is not anything big you just and ensure that you look at the walls you see them check for wall movement wall movement happens especially um in uh, new structures or it happens in uh, structures where uh you have an attachment to it uh where after uh, a building is built in an attachment. Sometimes um, building settles uh, differently check for uh, settlements uh, of the building. Uh, also uh, uh, correct any uh, settling issues. Settling 
sometimes may, may cause uh, cracks in building. Also look at proper maintenance of uh, landscape surfaces around the wall. Norm normally you have plantings of grass and all that around the walls, external walls especially. Uh, you need to always keep maintaining those areas to ensure that these walls look good. Um, other maintenance of wall, you can also have uh, flaking paint. When you use um, bad quality of paint, sometimes you have flaking paint or chalky paint. Uh, some paints do that. Or when the paint is old, it's been there for a long time. Or when the walls are also soaking water. When the walls are soaking water, once it soaks water and dries out, by the time it's drying out, it also affects uh, the quality of paint that is being used for the uh, also we also look at mods in the uh, which comes really from a uh, and damp dampness of um of uh, the walls once you have a leakage inside the wall uh which may which may come from water trap from gutters and the uh, clean of gutters is required uh, sometimes you need to identify uh, the leakage point and repair it and then allow the wall dries out and after you have allowed the wall dried out, you will now need to now repaint that wall and treat it. One of the things you must always, as much as possible, as facility manager guide against is this thing we call uh, capillary, capillary rise or dampness of wall. Dampness of wall is very, very difficult to manage and to treat in facilities. Mainly, you have that problem. If you do not solve the problem of the leakage, it will always be there. And for any facility you are managing, once you begin to have that issue, is is uh, is as if the devil has visited you, because it will never go away. If you have expressed what I'm saying, you will know that what I'm that. And the one, sometimes the problem comes at the time of um, the construction of the building. If we go back to uh, the foundation, let me go back to foundation and show you something there on that street foundation. Yes, there is something here foundation I want you to see. Yeah, I'm going to expand this. I hope you are seeing it. It's here. If you look at my cursor, you see it. DPC. I hope you can see it. I know it's need somebody to confirm if you can see it. DPC. Someone wants yes, to see it. Yes, we can see. Yes, we yeah. can see it. That DPC is a very important material in building foundation. No matter what happens, if you are privileged to be uh, where they are doing construction, do not for any reason allow anybody to skip this DPC. It's, the material is cheap, but it's very important. It's like uh, uh, there are different grades. Normally we use, uh, I always recommend this, a thousand gauge. There's 500 and there's a thousand. A thousand is much stronger. It's like a nylon material, which you spread on the foundation to prevent water from going, underground water from going into onto the top, top of surface. You normally spread that stuff before you do your final floor finish, before you do your German floor to ensure that it is sitting properly and it's supposed to cross across the foundation um, so that it prevents any uh, um, water moving from one level of the foundation to the other. If you do this, it will help the building. It will help what we call capillary rise, water movement from the foundation up, which normally happens in most buildings that, have, that are built in where you have high water tables. Even if you don't have buildings that are built in high water table area, some other buildings, because of accumulated groundwater, sits on the foundation and it moves up. So to prevent that, this DPC helps to prevent it. We must always ensure that we have that in our facility that we manage. And uh, if that is not done well, I, I don't know what to do. I can only wish you luck that God will help you to manage the capillary rise and the damp issues that come. But there are ways to manage it, but it's more expensive to do that. Uh, it will require a lot of technique. Uh, which um, it's always difficult for a client to be able to manage, uh, to pay for. Um, let's go back to, yes, we are at uh, and the mods. And then sometimes you have a, uh, where you have pipes. Uh, if you look at this picture here on this side, it's, you see that these pipes are the old governance pipes. In fact, that's why most buildings now do no longer use governance pipes. 
for their plumbing pipes. And I will also strongly add that we we'll run away from governance pipe because you cannot actually uh, uh, determine the quality of water that will be going through those pipes. And if the water has any form of iron in that water, after a while, it eats up the governance pipes and causes leakage. And those pipes burst inside the walls and begin to cause leakage. And it will take you a long time to be able to determine that. Also, when you are in areas where the water have a little bit of um, salt, uh, it's also very difficult to manage because the salt eats up the government after a while and then it causes leakage. So um, those are some of the things you must, as uh, a facility manager, for buildings you are, you are managing, try to avoid. Uh, where you are in that kind of facility where they use governance pipe and you are beginning to have all these problems, you may advise a client to change the pipe to um, uh, uh, I, I, I normally we prefer the multi-layer pipes or the PPR pipes, uh, which uh, which are becoming increasingly popular in the, in the market. Now, PVC pipes have been good, but it's difficult to get very good UPVC gauge pipes. There are a lot of fake in the market, so we will run away from it. Uh, but if you get a very good PVC pipe, and you have accessories that helps with the jointing part, so that it doesn't bust inside the wall and is able to meet up with the gauge of minimum of 10 bar, you'll be able to manage the cages happening in between the wall. Uh, you must ensure that the seals in between um, the pipes are properly done and jointed and uh, then um, managed properly. The cages in buildings are very difficult to maintain. Uh, sometimes uh, there's this uh, flooring type that uh, is called, uh, um, they used to cast the floors. Normally, if you are doing uh, concrete work or you are working on different levels, uh, there's uh, the holo clay pot. Holo clay pot is a lightweight form of um, casting uh, uh, structural elements, especially structural floors, suspended floors. It's lightweight, very advantageous, it's cheaper than the regular. Uh, reinforced concrete. It's also reinforced concrete, but it has lightweight. The only problem with this in leakages is that once you have a busted wall, a busted pipe in, in that uh, in that floor area, it's difficult to be able to identify where the origin of the leakage is coming from. At this time, I want to tell us as facility managers uh, that each time you are maintaining any building, you see any form of leakages. The first suspected areas you must look for. Don't be deceived by where you are seeing the leakage. Even if you are seeing the leakage in the sitting room or in the dining room, just one of the things you must know is that leave that area alone and go to where you have the water sources, which are normally the bathrooms or the kitchen. Go and look for leakages in those areas. If you are able to get that those areas are not leaking before you to the location where you are seeing the water. Sometimes water travels to a point. It can also travel through electrical conduit pipes and appear in several places. Sometimes water can be can travel from the AC condensate pipe that you buried inside the wall. That's why it's always uh, advisable to have your AC condensate pipes put into sleeves, PVC sleeves, so that it doesn't leak out. Uh, because sometimes these things can leak out and then leak into the walls and the wall begins to um, exhibit um, the characteristics of having a um, uh, uh, dampness of the wall. And you'll be, think, you'll be looking for the cost of it, not knowing that it's an A40 air conditioned uh, unit, that, it's not, uh, that the atmosphere probably would have failed in it. And so also insulate it and control the water from coming out. And then you begin to uh, battle it and you'll be having a rat race uh, going around the building all year round. Uh, ceiling. Ceilings and roof, types of ceilings. And ceilings are that part of the building that you normally use uh, to just give the building a fitting at the, at the suspended level. Uh, you have uh, different types of ceilings. You have the acoustic ceiling or spray ceilings. You have the uh, drywall ceiling, which is done with plasterboard. Uh, you have the suspended ceilings. You have the cathedral ceilings. Cathedral ceilings are what you find in churches. And for roof, you have the uh, flat roof which is normally flat as is called note. And you have the hip roof. You have hip roof. Hip roof is the one that has a slanted hop. You have hip, you have, you are, you are mentioning hip. 
anything that goes up that has a stop on the hip of and you have different types. You have the pitch, mono pitch, you have the um you have the um uh, the hip as you have seen here, and um, all the different kinds of fruits that you see in different patterns, all of them either you either it either falls into flat or falls into the hippo. And then those are the different type of fruits that um, you probably will see in a building. Uh, and the materials for roof sometimes for flat roof you can use uh, and then uh, aluminium or you use uh, concrete. Concrete, but most flat roofs are done with concrete uh, uh, materials. And uh, we'll go into the factors for selection of um, uh, ceiling finish. Normally, uh, there are different factors that uh, the clients use for the selection of ceilings. Uh, for floors and ceilings, so normally the floor type uh, determines the kind of ceiling that you use. The lifespan of the building or the duration of the building also. Uh, the It's fire resistance. Sometimes you may need to know some ceilings are not as fire resistant as the other. Uh, if you really want to be in a place where you want the fire resistance to be high, uh, there's a selection of ceilings you must use. Uh, instead of using the PVC, they have these PVC strips that are used as ceilings or tongue and groove um, uh, wooden uh, ceilings. If you are preventing, if you are running away from fire, you shouldn't use that kind of uh, uh, roof type because of front of fire. Appearance of the ceiling is also a factor. And then also uh, the function of the building, uh, safety of the occupant, you know, also factors that you can, that determine the type of material. Factors for the selection of roof. How strong the finish is, it is um, ability to uh, transverse lights that sometimes you require um, your roof to be able to transverse light to uh, the occupants, the cost uh, and the attractiveness, and also the load uh, of the roof also determines the kind of uh, roof that you will use for the building. Types of ceilings, uh, you have, like I mentioned earlier, we have the plasterboard ceilings. You have the drywall ceilings, uh, types of roof, uh, material finishes. You have the plastic roof um, sheets, which is not popular again. And those are used to be uh, there. You have the corrugated governance sheets. You have the uh, uh, fiberglass sheets. You have the polycarbonate sheets. Uh, you have the madre tiles that are used for roof ceiling materials. You have the wooden boards commonly used for general uh, structures of the building. You have the plasterboard. Uh, you have the wooden panels and planks. Uh, you have the stencil. You have the uh, metal ceiling tiles, uh, which are, uh, and also you have uh, uh, some uh, more papers that are used. Uh, roofing materials are some of the ones we are seeing here. You have asbestos roof, um, asphalt roof is there. Uh, you have uh, wooden sticks. You have metal roof. Um, also, uh, for repairs of roof, <laughs> normally uh, for office spaces where you have um, uh, water damage due to uh, roof or water damage due to leakage, uh, normally you look for the source of the leakage. You sort it out first and allow the roof, uh, the ceiling dry out. After it has dried out, then you can either paint or change the damaged roof uh, depending on uh, the area where that is uh, done. Uh, roof repair damage is a usual uh, as a result of uh, for long span or uh, when you don't use the right gauge of roof. Anyway, for 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 roofing, especially for long span aluminium, which is which has become which has become increasingly popular these days, um, there is there are different gauges for long span aluminium, and uh, because of cost, a lot of uh, uh, somehow go for a lesser quality. The best quality of roof, uh, long span aluminum roof you use normally for your building, whether the one you are managing or your personal building, should actually be a 7.5 gauge. The gauge is normally 7 uh, uh, mm gauge. But what you really have in the market these days is a 0.5. 0.5 is not good. And uh, well, I really do not advise that. But if you are using a point four, four five, it means that you need to increase the lapping of the roof so that when uh, you have heavy downpour and then uh, 
doesn't affect the roof and not leakage um, in the roof. Types of floors, we have laminate floor, we have a um, tile floor, which we are used to, we have the hardwood floor, we have the carpet floor, and uh, we have uh, the ceramic um, tiles, we have the marble fly tiles, and then um, we have also granite and all sorts of floor finish. So, finished floors uh, are also part of structures, especially um, in areas um, where you have, where you have uh flooding and you do not want to do a very elaborate foundation you just do suspended floor but it's using timber joist and a little bit of concrete uh, column and then uh, for 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 office buildings you have the raised floor is also a suspended floor to enable you move cables uh from one point or underneath at uh, the different points you also have a um, solid floor which is only made from a uh, concrete which you are used to Concrete materials, you have the sub base, the concrete, the uh, cement floor screed, uh, sand, and then the uh, damp movement bill installation, like either the movement, that's what we call the uh, PVC, uh, sorry, uh, DPC. Such floor structures, you have the raised floor, you have balconies, you have glass floor, uh, you will probably see different types of floor, floor coverings, you have soft flooring. Uh, 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 Florins and uh, which are made from rubber from vinyl sheets. Uh, that you, use. you have the hard floor, which is normally made from concrete or ceramic tiles, granite, marble, vitrified tiles from brick or even tiles. Or tiles is really old fashioned. This is I, I suddenly see buildings used for tiles for their floors. Um, floor problems. <laughs> Tricks a lot. Uh, you also have a uh, um, floor vibrating where the tiles are the movement in floors, especially in wooden floors, it is not properly installed. Based from time to time, you also have walk and, and floor cracks that happens where uh, you are supposed to have a, um, expansion joints and the expansion joints are not positioned well, or rather, they are not even positioned. Uh, after a while, the building, the wall, or the floor will crack. And what that happens, you have to uh, introduce this expansion joint. We crack also is due to bad weather or um, uneven building settlement, uh, depending on. Clean of floors is something that I don't do too much on this. Um, cleaning is a regular thing for facility. Uh, you must know what to clean and how to clean wooden floors. Uh, you clean, like you clean the furniture, you clean, uh, uh, you do your mopping, you sweep, and then you mop uh, from time to time. Uh, I think this is a list of everything that we should be able to do uh, for towels, uh, stones, you know how to do the deep cleaning and all the separate type of cleaning. I won't dwell on this so you can read this up on your own. Uh, cleaning schedule, uh, daily schedule, you need to dust, sweep, and mop. Weekly, you Vacuum monthly, you polish for tiles or uh, for wooden finish. Uh, quarterly, you do your deep clean. Uh, that's when you do very major cleaning. And then uh, you know how to handle all that to ensure that your building or your facility is always and nice each time uh, um, the, the guest comes in. Then windows. Uh, windows is that part of the building that provides um, fenestration and ventilation. Fenestration product that provides light into the building. Uh, imagine if you have a all wall building without windows, uh, there won't be any form of light. There are some areas that normally have that, but um, but generally we always have and there are different types of windows. Either have fixed windows or movable windows. Uh, fixed windows are the ones that are fixed that do not. The purpose is just to throw in light. The purpose is just to train light into the building. Um, they are installed in different parts. They are not for ventilation purposes. Um, they are just fixed to throw in light uh, into a particular space. You have the casement window. Casement windows are the ones you open, like you open your hand, uh, normally wide. Uh, you have the 
skylight window, you have the roof lanterns. The roof lanterns are spots points on the roof that show light, the daylight into uh, into the building. Uh, sometimes they use the um, uh, uh, fiberglass, glass, especially if you go to very large warehouses or industries, they have a lot of that, uh, those kind of uh, roof uh, material there where during the day they don't put on lights. The light just comes directly from the roof. Lightens up the warehouse, lightens up everywhere during the day, then at night they put on their lights. Uh, skylight windows are, they are, they are actually put at points, at slope, uh, just to draw in light um, at different points of the of the building roof um, cover, uh, window coverings you have the applied film sometimes you put film on the windows on the glass to shield uh, against the uh, solar effects on like tinting of the glass like what you have in cars you can do that for your normal windows you can also have windows with uh, reflective glass tinted glasses you also have the uh, the cellular shades you have the drippers or you have the interior uh, low uh, uh, shutters that you normally know, put in the windows. You also have the window hoods that provide external shade for a building. You have the external external solar shield, external solar screens that you put uh, in front of the building to shield it. And you also have a, like roller shutters that help to protect the windows um, from the effect of weather and from vandals. Uh, you also have uh, window glazing. You have a spectral selected coat. Uh, you have the reflective coat, uh, coating. Reflective are the ones that uh, once you see from outside, especially during the day, uh, it is like mirrors. It is like mirrored glass that you see from inside. You see clearly, or from outside, uh, it it um, pales light. Uh, it helps to give uh, a lot of um, good um, um, protective points from inside the window, so nobody sees you inside. Uh, when they are looking at you from the outside, they don't see you. Um, inside but you inside can see them outside uh, window frames you have the composite frames for the window you have aluminum frames you have the vinyl frames you have glass frames depending on the type or what you want uh it's just it's just a material finish and those materials help you to know and understand how uh, to manage your window we have to also have the wooden frames for window uh, materials can also be wood or also um, be uh, made of aluminum. Aluminum has become increasingly popularly used for windows uh, these days. So uh, most windows that you see compared to the traditional one that we used to know in those days that are made of hardwood, they are now made of aluminum or metal, um, uh, other um, uh, metal um, stuff. You also have vinyl materials that are also used for uh, window framing. Windowmen use them, um, weather strips uh, to reduce air or uh, water um, infiltration, uh, whether sheets are, are, are the sealants that go around yeah, this rubber that uh, we call it glazing rubber that are used to hold the windows or rather hold the glasses in place into their frames to ensure you don't have leakage around the windows. And then um, check for windows, um, that the windows and then the windows hardware, the locks, opening mechanism to ensure that they are working well. Uh, for, for most of the times, uh, casement windows and sliding windows are always corporate um, these days. So, uh, sliding windows, because each sliding windows normally they have these small rollers that are underneath the window, under the the track of the window that allows it slides properly. And um, from if it's not if it's not if it's not a good type, after a while those rubber, those uh, rollers fail. The rollers fail, and then that's why you have sliding windows getting stuck. It's difficult to open sometimes. Know that and you get a professional that will lift the window up, check the rollers, and fix it properly, and then install it back. Once he's able to do it, he discovers that the window will move and smooth. Then for the um, for the uh, um, casement windows, the hinges that opens the windows are always comfortable, just like hinges and the door door hinges. Uh, sometimes it fails, and if they use a low quality one, it affects. Um, the other one that has, that has to do with the maintenance of windows is the cleaning of the dust and the operational process of the windows, the lock edge of the window. You need to also check it to ensure that all those things are working very well. Window repair for uh, normally uh, decay happens to wind to wood when it is abandoned, so uh, we must look at it um, and then ensure that we always check our, our wooden frame, ensure that it does not decay 
of uh, our four shots. Uh, we need to check the pins. It's always good for you to use treats to ensure that the windows uh, uh, material do not just fail. Once it's properly treated, uh, it will be difficult for it to run. And if you use the right material for the window, uh, it is difficult for it to also rot also. Uh, sometimes you paint them after you treat them properly and then it helps to uh, maintain the window. Um, those are the other things you read for yourself. Uh, for doors, I want us to take a break now before I go into doors. I think doors should be here as the last part of it. So I'll take I'll take a five or 10 minutes break if it's okay with you, or you want us to continue? Then it's okay, sir. Okay, so let's take a 10 minutes break. We should be back in uh, by 5.33. So our break, so let's take our break now. By 5.33, we'll be back to continue for us. And please let's write our questions though, please, so that uh, I think I'll just keep your questions so when the class go off uh, when we are done with we'll
Okay, uh, can we can we start? Yes. Yes, let's start. Sir. Okay, great. Um, doors. We talked about windows before we went on the break. Uh, now we're talking about doors. Those are uh, those part of the building that grants you access into every individual space. That if you have various types of doors that are used in a building. And uh, the the doors itself, they are they are classified. They are, the types of doors are classified into four different types. You have the ones that are uh, uh, classified based on the components that are used to. Or uh, the other one is um, the uh, the method of construction of the door itself. Uh, then another one is your operation of the door, how the door works. Then uh, another one is the construction material used. The door uh, that determines the names and the type of this door we are talking about. Like I mentioned, uh, doors grant you access into any space. And then uh, the doors are normally used uh, to access from external to internal and then to, to assess the different internal spaces. Uh, the, we just look at the doors very fast, different types of doors, so I just know them, which you already know, but probably some of them, you don't know, uh, the names and how it relates. You have um, the types of doors based on uh, the placing of the components. And uh, based on the arrangement of the door components, the doors are classified into one. You have the button and ledge doors. This is the ledge, and that are the buttons. And ledge doors. These are those are the kind of doors. Probably you know these doors in your in, your, in the old houses. Uh, you also have the button, ledge, and brace doors. You have the button. You have the sorry, the ledge, the button, and the brace on the side. You know this type of door. Then you have the button, the ledge, and the frame doors. The frames are framed around, and these are the budget button, these are the ledges uh, for the, that type of door. You also have the button, the ledge, the breeze, and the frame door. It has all everything together. You can put the frame first. You have the buttons in between. You have the breeze, the hexagonal breeze, and the ledge on the side. Types of doors based on the uh, method of construction. You have the frame and panel doors where you have the frame and you have the panel, the different panels of the doors. Uh, you also have the glazed door, glazed door made of glass You is very popular. You have the louver doors, something like this that you are seeing, uh, made of wooden louvers. Uh, sometimes it's made of glass. You have the flush doors. Flush doors are uh, like that, just flush like you use, in, especially in most offices. Uh, you have hollow and cellular core flush doors, like something like that, that has web inside. You have the wired uh, gauge doors. Then you also have door types that are based on the working mechanism, uh, mechanism the operational mechanism. You have the revolving door like this because it revolves, it goes round. You have the sliding door, uh, like you see. You have the swing door, the swing door. You have the cool steel door, like this one, the collapsible steel. And you have the roller shutters, the roller steel shutter door, like the ones you have in stores, plus stores and the garages, personal garages. Then types of doors based on the material that is used. You have the steel um, sheet doors, corrugated steel sheet doors, like all these that we see. Uh, you have uh, the hollow steel doors that has hollow, that are hollow in it. And you have the metal covered uh, plywood doors, doors that are uh, most of these Israeli doors are actually like this. They have the they are metal sheets, but they are um, covered in uh, plywood doors. Other broad types of doors, you have the French door. Um, uh, it opens up 
a space is branches are normally wide allows for big entry and exit you have the aluminum doors of course we know that using either interior or exterior has advantage of resisting weather resistance conditions they are light uh, they're lightweight and does not transmit so much load to the foundation uh, the frame are not affected by timers and they last longer and that's the advantage of having like an aluminum door the door components door stoppers are the, the door stoppers are the tiniest uh, uh, wood, wooden materials or rather metal materials that are placed on the door to stop the door from uh, when it opens from over swinging in its um, part to, to, to prevent um, the doors from not um, from affecting the hinges. And also you have the door lintels. We know what lintels are. Uh, they are. They are that top of the door part of the building. Uh, sorry, it's called the uh, the lintel, that part that is above is the original part, like a beam that is above the building. Architrave, the architrave is that wooden, you know, that frame that you see out on the out surface of the door, just directly on top of the door frame. You have the seal, the seal is the bottom part of the door. That's what we call the seal. And we have the, uh, uh, when you have door, door, general door maintenance, what, what are the things you check out or look out for? Uh, when you're looking at door maintenance, uh, one of the things you look out for is uh, does the door, uh, when the door does not close properly, you check the door, uh, uh, if the door is uh, swelling due to bad weather or humidity, or the door, uh, uh, the lift of the door handle uh, when trying to, when you nearly try to open or close the door, if you have to lift the door handle, check, uh, if it works easily and then uh, look at uh, the hinges most of the times it's probably the hinge uh, got it out of position sometimes when the door they open the door and it rubs on the floor it sticks to the frame or rubs on the on the frame you need to adjust especially for wooden door you may need to adjust that uh, properly uh, when the door does not latch properly when it doesn't latch you may need to work on the frame to ensure that that happens when cold uh, comes in uh, uh, air around the door that means the door is not sealing properly the gaps are probably uh, you have leakage around the gaps of the door door maintenance you check for the flush bolt flush bolt are the bolts that are attached to the door that flushes properly that goes that you lock up and down uh, especially for double doors uh, then you look at the door frames door frames uh, you inspect the door frames regularly to ensure that there are no infect uh, uh, termite infestation and the material is not uh, rotting and then uh, also check if the material is using uh, for uh, for glass uh, for glass um, light. Uh, you need to check regularly for cracks in case because of some people they don't know how to manage when they smash the door frame. Sometimes the glasses may crack. Check all the locks uh, that the opening mechanisms are open well. Check for the op door operation that they approach smoothly. Check for the screws that are in the door, especially on the hinges. Uh, that it tightens properly and check that uh, you don't even have death uh, st uh, sticking on the hinge or the track of the of the door itself. Uh, check the screws that uh, they are properly fastened and uh, uh, just check generally the seals of the door that uh, they are properly uh, in place so that uh, you don't have any issues uh, from that. I think this should be the last part. I'll take our questions now. Yes, thank you. That's the last slide. So I'll take our questions now, please. Let's ask a lot of questions so that I can attend to. That's why I had to quickly go through these slides. So I'll have a few time to take questions, please. I know today is Salah, so uh, please let's take questions. Yes, uh, Ola and me, I'll take your question. Um, <clears throat> uh, well done, sir. Thank um, you. Thanks for the thanks for the elaborate uh, lecture today. Uh, it was quite uh, it was quite uh, revealing. Um, I want to ask. Uh, you mentioned something about um, the DPC. Yes. Uh, and that yes. Um, uh, I want to ask: Is it every building that requires that? Yes, because there's some lands. There's some lands that are not in the water lodge area, and uh, 
requires PVC. Maybe in a hopper here. Every building yes. requires every building requires whether it is whether you're in a waterlogged area, upper lands. Because even at the upper lands, there's normally moisture retention within the foundation of the building. And after a while, water comes up. It just comes through the walls and comes up. That's why sometimes if you don't put this PVC, even if you are not on the ground floor, capillary rise on the upper floor. Okay. With, with, the, with the concrete, this uh, German concrete, um, what's called, the, the casting of the, or on top of the foundation will lead also uh, act as a form of a moisture barrier for the- well, well, concrete actually does not act as a moisture barrier. It really ab absorbs moisture uh, at a given level, especially if it's not waterproofed. If Cement. It's proof, it will absorb uh, moisture. But when it's waterproofed, it doesn't. That's why we use uh, that uh, APC to actually, it's actually a preventive measure to ensure that that doesn't happen. Sometimes you may be lucky that you have uh, your foundation not um, uh, gathering moisture and it dries out easily. You may not have that problem. It's always okay. better to be careful than sorry. Okay, next question I want to ask. Um, sorry, sorry, I have like about three or four questions. Go ahead, please. Okay. Go Second one I want to ask, um, um, the best sealant that is required for uh, expansion joints, I, I do have expansion joint issues uh, during the rainy season like this. Um, you see the expansion joint expanded because of the, uh, the temperature change, the thermal change. So thereby allowing rainwater into some part of the building. So if you use some sealant at the time, um, there's a particular chemical that uh, somebody recommended that uh, we try to use and some other things. So I want to know if there's any particular recommended uh, material that can be used for expansion joint to seal it, at least to, I know it might not last forever, but at least for appreciable for several years. Okay. So um, I that. Me, what I normally use, expansion joints, which has worked for me, that's the only thing I've used for a long time throughout my, for all the times I've been working, that it has worked, it has never failed. I use bitumen. Bitumen. Yes, I fill bitumen into that space so that I do not make it rigid. You know, bitumen has its expansion characteristics. Elastic. It seals elastic characteristics. Yes, it can expand. And so when it's expanding, it, it will expand properly and it returns back without any problem. It doesn't break. So that I normally use bitumen. I, I, I use the, the wet, I send the bitumen into the space, fill it up. Once I fill it up and uh, it's properly done, I don't have any penetrations from water. Bitumen okay. is water resistant, and so if water comes and it doesn't, it doesn't allow. So it works very well. Even for sometimes in my foundation work that I do, I put around the foundation, especially the internal and the external, would to ensure that water doesn't travel uh, horizontally through the foundation, so it doesn't lead to capillary rise. Also. Okay. So um, actually, I've, um, in some part of uh, the floors, I've used uh, bitumen and this quota thing to actually help. But there are some areas that bitumen will not look, uh, for aesthetics reasons, purposes. I know you, you, you look, look. I know you, sometimes you wouldn't, but if you have the person that is doing it, if they, if they apply it properly, after they apply it to the areas you want it to go, you now scrape the external part out and slightly clean it. Once you do that, you just see the black line neatly. It won't, it won't splash. Okay, okay. You okay. must be doing it and to give you your job. That's why I, I can't recommend anything else. That's what I've used and it has worked for me. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. And then um, the the one for the bit, I mean, the gauge, sorry, for the roofing sheet, you mentioned 7.5. Yes, it's very scarce these days. Oh, okay. So I just want to be sure of that uh, particular grid. Well, or aluminium sheet, you mean? What you really see in the market is 0.45. Okay, 0.45. But it's the one that is very... But it's just that, you know, the way these China people are, 
the 0.45 is not actually 0.45. The point normally, if you buy and use your gauge to check, if you are buying a 0.45, because of the quoting on top of it, it's supposed to be slightly above 0.5. It's actually supposed to be yeah. 0.5 because of the quoting. The aluminum itself, if it's 0.45 and the quoting is added to it, it strengthens it. But the Chinese one is actually like 0.3. By the time you put the quoting, it will not be 0.5. Oh. Check it, you now say it's 0.5. When you put it on the roof, you discover it's very light. I think I think it's the work of the standard um, organization of Nigeria who ought to regulate that. Yeah, Even I, mean, I, I I I got to know about the uh, the iron rod. Yes, that, exactly. uh, the gauge. Yes. Mm, when you are getting maybe sixteen mm, you are actually be getting maybe fourteen mm or yes. something similar to that. I think. Uh, so I, I think. Um, years ago, I fell into that that problem. I the the time they, they supplied us the reinforcement, something just said I should check. I went to buy there's what we call the veneer caliper that we used to check the gauge and yeah. of the tickets. I just plugged it and I was shocked when I saw it. Sixteen M was giving me for I had to return the whole the whole almost uh, three hundred tons of reinforcement. Oh, they had to they had to come and take it out <laughs> and resupply again because what they do now is that it, especially for the um, for the, uh, the the twisted rods, they add they now discover they now start to add the the twisting of the rod to the gauge of the rod, which is not mm. supposed to be. the corrugation. The corrugation. By the time you you put the, you see that like to be sixteen mm, you where you put the veneer caliper. But if you go to the main rod itself and put it, you discover it's fourteen. So that's the deception. But that one has to always be uh, once you are doing that, once you are buying those materials. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Um, who will I take? Lawa, your hands was up first, so let me take you. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you, Lawa. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the uh, today's lecture. So interesting. Yes, I have this uh, question. Like when uh, you started earlier, you talk about uh, this uh, building crack. Yes, sir. So I want to, from your own experience, I want to really know the main cause of that crack because I have an experience. My uncle, when he built his house, it was virtually concrete, even the walls, and it traveled out of the concrete. When I came back, I think five years after, getting there to do some cleanings, yeah, we still notice cracks and the edges. Edges and uh, some other places like that. Even even the so-called uh, concrete. So I don't okay. know. Is uh, it is it is it spiritual or? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> really, I don't understand. I don't understand. It's don't spiritual understand. because nature abhors vacuum. <laughs> okay, let me explain to you. There are different causes of crack in a building. Uh, I was expecting someone to ask this. It's very smart of you to have asked it. We have what we call structural cracks, and what we have what we call fascia cracks. Fascia cracks are the ones that are not, um, they are nothing to worry about. Um, due to bad workmanship and bad use of plastering material, the plaster that you use, the plaster sand that you use for plastering, if you don't use the proper plaster sand, it will cause crack after a while. Okay. By the time the, the is drying out. Uh, that kind of crack, once you see it, if you tap it after a while, it falls off and you see the main base of the building still intact. It's not, it's not, it doesn't go through. Uh, that is probably we do. We be, for, for concrete buildings too, if the, if the plastic material does not bond very well with the concrete wall, it causes crack. There's something you do once you cast a wall. If you cast the wall and the wall is very smooth, and you do not ensure that the surface is rough before you do uh, apply your, your cement plaster. After a while, it cracks and falls off. So normally what we do is that once you have a concrete wall that is very smooth, we do what we call tyrolin. We tyrolin that wall before we plaster that wall, before we apply any form of plaster on and it. And what is that tyrolin, sir? Tyrolin is made from a mixture of water and cement itself. It is just crushed oh. on the wall. There's a okay. terrible okay. to the wall. Okay. okay. Yes. 
put it into the mix. What did you call it like again? Tyrolene. Um, yeah. Can you spell that, sir? Um, Tyro, T R O, Lin. T R O, then Lin, L Y E N. Okay. Yes. Once you once any building um, contractor that you if you don't know anything about Tyrolin, please sack that person. <laughs> Tyrolin is actually T Y R O L E N E. And okay, that, that's not a fair Yeah, that's Thank you, Paul. All right. Well, how do you know the one that is a structural crack and a surface crack? Oh, just dealing with surface cracks. I've never started with structural, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, structural cracks are the ones that happen foundation of the building, and it's normally due to one bad workmanship, two. Uh, when the building is settling, when it's not settling evenly. Remember I talked about building settlements. Mm. When the building doesn't mm -hmm. settle well. Uh, the, when the foundation is not properly laid and then the building is settled differentially. Once it's settled differentially, it's as if it's now you are forcing the part of the building to go down than the other one. It will cause the building to crack. No matter the material you use, whether you use concrete or you use wood or whatever. That's why the foundation of the building must be done properly to ensure that the building sits well. When you have structural cracks, it's always very, very complicated. Uh, sometimes it may even lead to you demolishing one side of the building because um, it will take you um, a lot of detailed work to be able to correct that. Um, there, there are some things you need to do to correct it. When it's not too bad, you can um, actually seal the two parts of the building together by using bonding agents. Uh, you mix bonding agents into the concrete that you are going to do. You have to use a high grade concrete. I always recommend minimum of grade 30 concrete uh, to be used to meet in uh, meet up in between those two parts that is cracked. And uh, you mix that with the bonding agent to ensure that it's used properly from the old to new concrete so that you don't have that. But you actually, once you see a structural crack that is due to building settlement, you must allow the building to settle very well before you normally you allow that settle to happen. You watch the crack for a minimum of six months to see how it. You, in fact, what you now do is that you start measuring from the day you do it, you calibrate it, you start measuring it and check and see the movement. You get to a point where the crack will stop. Once it stops, that is when you now start your remedy and work on it. Um, but it's, it's not very likely for you to have that if the building is properly done. And that's why you don't really have so much of structural cracks. But if you have that, it's a really a cause of concern. Can now I, I hope I'm answering this crack. Can I ask a question about this crack? Another question, sir. Okay, now and uh, Tilda, please hold on. Let Lawa finish. Okay. Okay. Yes. I uh, out of out of uh, this uh, sun. Sharp sun. Sharp sun. And it's best to feel uh, sharp uh, network. Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, probably just type your question and send it to me. Oh. Send it on the chat. I can't hear you. Yes, I can hear you now, sir. I said sharp sun. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, I said uh, out of uh, sharp sand and clay, the ones, uh, the regular ones they use to fill foundation. Which one is best? Because I notice after sometimes uh, you start having crack on the uh, floor. Okay, um, I, I I understand what you are saying, um, but really. The truth is that uh, most of the times where you have uh, the use of either uh, sharp sand or clay, you, you, clay is not a good material for filling inside the foundation. There's what we call laterite. Laterite is not clay. It's, um, if you are using, even if you are using, um, I, I normally prefer sharp sand, but sharp, sharp sand is very expensive. Um, it's more expensive than laterite. Uh, sharp sand does okay. not... Um, up so much water, so it's it's almost uh, um, properly uh, compressed as it is. 
um, you you once once you once you normally once you do that that uh, back peel into your foundation, uh, a lot of persons are not patient enough to ram it properly to ensure that it sits well before they they continue their work. And normally the best material to use to ram or to compact that uh, foundation uh, back actually water. You actually need to use water. You fill that part with water. You actually soak it up with water. Water will uh, ensure that all the air bubbles inside the sand escapes out and allow the particles to settle properly. You have done that. You use your plate compactor or whatever compactor that you use. Roll it over it to ensure that it is stable and strong before you add your stone base or your uh, hardcore, and then you continue with your uh, German floor. One of the reasons why some of these floors crack or they sink is because they don't do German floor at the time they're supposed to do it. They build the walls first before they do the flooring. Once you do that, yeah, it's a recipe for failure for that floor. Okay, thank you, sir. That's it. Thank you. The old... Yeah, um, hello? My question yes, is, I, I, mean, I want to follow a follow question to the cracking question we were asking about. I have a building yes. that is on more than 10 years. This is the, yeah. each time I go there, I notice a crack, there's a crack, and it's on the upper side of the building. And it keeps widening, it's been filled before, but it keeps recurring. Okay, that crack, is it coming from the ground floor? Um, no, I don't see it on the lower floor, I see it only on the upper floor, on the um, upper floor, yeah. Okay, sometimes it may be, uh, I don't know the floor you're talking about, uh, if it's the final floor, that means that you did not have it's any form a two of floor uh, house. The, the, the first floor. You said it's a two-floor house? Yeah. Okay, that means you're talking about the final floor. Yeah, the final floor of, yeah. It, it's probably what the problem is, the building is having now is that this is not coming from the ground. It's because they probably they did not have what we call a roof beam in that building. A roof beam? The roof Yes, roof beam. It's supposed to transmit, and there's all either the roof beam or call it roof beam or tie beam. It's supposed to ring around the building on the, on top of the building. Once you don't have that, the roof directly, the load from the roof is settling, um, uh, is is settling scatteredly on the walls. So sometimes once it does that, it's it causes it to disintegrate in some areas. That's why you see cracks. Okay. So because if you probably look at that. Up. If you send somebody to go up to check around that wall in the building inside the ceiling, you will see that it doesn't have a roof beam. It's supposed to most buildings are supposed to have roof beam. Sometimes construction, uh, all these contractors they don't do it because they want to save costs and uh, uh, probably chop the person's money and say hey, you don't need it. Then this and that and that. But that is it has a way of preventing that kind of crack because it's what ties the whole building on top to ensure that the load that is transmitted is transmitted uniformly around the building. Okay, because uh, the uh, the ground the floor is a place that is prone to erosion, and so we have this uh, underground um, tanks to take care of the erosion. So when it's raining, water just goes into that place, and all of a sudden, one of those tanks um, uh, fell. One of them gave way. The but tank, I haven't seen it. Well, if it's if the, if uh, once the crack is not coming from the foundation of the that's building, that's what I need to look out for now to see whether it's, there's anywhere that is coming from up. But the one down is the one, the one that there's anyone down. The one up is the one that is very visible and they're scary. Uh, yeah, once it's not coming from the bottom of the, and the way you are describing that's that's what I think is wrong with it because you said okay. it's expanding and um, yeah. um, once if it's coming from the bottom, you will see it. It will it, you you will miss it. For you to be noticing it on top. And you don't know yeah. it's on the bottom, it's not coming from the bottom. If it's coming from on top and it's expanding, you would have seen it. It will take that line, will continue all the way down. Okay. Yes, the, so, the area may be to erosion. Beam, uh, beam yes, now. the tanks that you probably. You said? Can, we, can the beam still, the roof beam uh, still be done now? Yes, it can be done, but you have to take out the roof. My God. Entirely, completely. So that's the once you take out the roof entirely. You cast the roof beam on top on top of it, and once you do that, oh. uh, if the building is you don't have columns on that first floor, then uh, yeah, there's a bigger problem for you. Hmm. That means you have to introduce columns to send from the first floor down to the uh, ground floor. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anthony, please, your hands is up. Okay, Anthony, are you there? Okay, uh, Anthony is already. Let's do Kingsley. I'm ready, please. Good evening, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Good evening, yeah. Thanks for the <laughs> lectures. Sorry, you two things. You said DPC. Does it have a full? Is DPC the, uh, the acronyms or it has a full meaning? The DPC downproof cost. So, sorry? Downproof cost. Oh, okay. Downproof cost. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Then you were talking about partitioning. Partitioning. Do we have a partition that is uh, soundproof? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, it depends on names, where you want to use. Uh, yes, it's, it's a not hall. a name. It's just it's a hall, right? Okay, great. Yes, it's normally a hall. Um, there's all. Partition it for. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, you... What? You want to partition the hall I didn't get that, to I didn't... be used. You want to partition the hall to be used as classrooms. The classrooms, okay. Uh, yes, uh, okay, great. Normally, uh, there's this, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, but normally um, when I do partition, um, I use what I call, what they call plaster boards on two sides of the partition. And in between the plaster board, once it's for insulation, we put what we call rock wool. If you go to the market, you just ask for rock wool. It depends on the thickness of the rock wool. We look for a very thick one, and you put it. Is the very thick ones that comes like it comes like a bread. It looks like bread, like this way. You just slot it into the in between the partition and close it up. Once you seal it up, it it provides the insulation you need. Noise will not transmit, but you must ensure that the partition goes from the roof to the floor. Down, okay. Once you do that and you add the rock wool in between, it will not allow uh, 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 sound to transmit or go through it. That's the way to insulate. All right, all right, sir. Yes, Thank sir. you, sir. Uh, all right, then. Okay, um, who am I here? Kinsley, please. Well, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. My question is still on this um, DPC because um, <clears throat> I wouldn't know if. Um, if that was done or not. The, the property that I'm presently, the FM, we're having challenges of um, water. In fact, um, recently we just repented almost the whole office because we had water dumped wall from the ground floor, from the ground to the almost half of the, the wall. We had to scrape everything and repent. Now, before we did the repenting, we the guys recommended what is called undercoat. And then we yes. which we did, we bought undercoat, we did everything. As we're talking to you now, it's just it's about um, a week gone. The wall has resurfaced again, the water issue has come up again. So my question now is how do we can we solve this? Well, because there, um, there, okay. there are issues um, coming up from the management aspect that that means the undercoat they got or what they did was not properly done. I don't want to believe that because I, actually with them when they were applying all of that, at some point we had to we screen as well, screen those affected areas just to ensure that this thing is being stopped. But we're still experiencing it. Okay. Okay, um, let, let me put it this way. Sorry, sorry to the women in the house. Um, there's this thing you call foundation that they use for their face when they want to do their makeup. Um, <laughs> ladies, uh, you have you, hey God. the kind of spots you see on the ladies. Sorry, sorry to the ladies. I've apologized uh, so that I hope um, so that uh, you, you understand. I just want to use that as an analogy. Um, the, the, the foundation, no matter the spot the lady has on the face, once you apply that foundation first, it covers it before you now apply the makeup. And when you see the lady now, ah, you just, ah, this person has changed. Well, those spots would have disappeared. But the truth is that the spot did not go anywhere. You just <laughs> did what we call cosmetics. You just covered it. The problem is still there. You just use the undercoat to cover it. You think it has gone. It has not gone anywhere. 
that's the problem with probably the DPC they put in that building probably would have failed or they did not put at all. And normally what now happens, the kind of solution you need to do is that there's what we call war. And it's, a little, it's an expensive venture where the, you need to dig down into the foundation again, apply a little bit of bitumen on the sides of the foundation, especially around the building. Then you now break at a particular level of the floor of the wall. You break very close to where the floor is. You break it around and now begin to apply a particular waterproofing chemical. I cannot tell you the name of the chemical because normally I have a company that I give that thing to and they just come to do it. They just apply it around the building and allow it to sit for like two, three weeks and then uh, uh, use the bitumen felt to paint again around that area before you apply your undercoat and then because before you now uh, plaster again and then paint. Normally, if you even want to do a surface work, you, you need to crack out the plaster around that area and we plaster with waterproofing cement and then apply your undercoat before you paint. If you don't do that and that place is really bad, you will keep seeing that problem over and over and over again. Hmm, that's indeed expensive because going through all that. Okay, then another question is, I, I keep having wet wall. There's no piping in the wall, no? I've done it. No, it's capillary rise. It's the same thing, Oba. It's the same thing. It's, like, it's groundwater. Groundwater is coming up. The, the, the water, the, the, the deep the sea. Floor. You see, that thing can be very crazy sometimes. If it's coming from the third floor, that means there's a leaking pipe somewhere. Maybe not on the third floor. Maybe it's coming on the upper floor. Yeah, but, but um, I'm looking at it, the, the wall, the centered wall, because normally when a building is being done, I think the piping comes through the other side of the way it can easily be channeled into the, the toilet or the bath. But this is in the middle wall, the center wall. I've done all my traces. Even okay, the, I, the I don't... tank is not located anywhere close to that. I don't know if you were in the class when, we were, when I said this thing. I said, once you have a leakage anywhere in the building, one of the first things you have, especially... Okay. All the water sources. Check all the pipes and check it very, very well. Check the pipe, do an audit of the pipe to ensure that no pipe is leaking from anywhere. Once you have done that, the next thing you need to also check, you also check the electrical conduit pipes and ensure you don't have air conditioner condensate that are leaking into the wall that will carry the water from where it is to another part of the pipe building where it will go and appear. I don't know if you understand. Yes, I do. I do. All right. Thank you very so much. You need to that, that investigation. I'll just, just carry out the investigation. I want to do it's very important. That's the only way you can get it. Okay. Right. Um, Tony, uh, please. Um, I can see your hand. Ramoni is not ready. Let's hear from Daniel. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready okay, here. Now. Okay. Right. Please, I want you to explain and enlighten me about underpinning. I know it has to do with correcting condition defects, but how is it done? Somebody once asked me that question. <laughs> so please. Jesus, guys, you what? Underpinning, you're supposed to pay for this kind of question, though. I, I know, I'm not supposed to give you that, this kind of question. That, that's one. The other question has to do with building conversion. You have a residential building, somebody is buying up the building and is ready to convert it to a uh, commercial. And you know, the internal, the partitioning wall be in, in between, we give way. Yeah, sorry. We give way. Now, in that, in that wise, uh, the, there's something they need to do in order to ensure that the new usage, the building itself will not uh, collapse in uh, in two or three years time. So what do they need to do in building conversion? Because that's what, what we now have in major CBDs in Ibadan, because I, I, I'm in Ibadan. So you still see people buying up the old house. They don't demolish the whole of the building. They just give the internal work away and start conversion. 
But in recent times, at the end of the day, the whole building collapsed. So what are the things they need to do right from the foundation to ensure that the scenario that will happen at the end of the day doesn't happen? Okay, um, the two questions you have asked anyway, they are one and the same. Um, okay. That happens during the building renovation. Okay. Actually, this kind of thing is what I do, and I really you are supposed to pay me. I'm not supposed to tell you on this thing. I'm to Don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, Ogapo will pay you. We'll pay okay. you later. Can you imagine what this man is saying? Okay, you see me. <laughs> yeah, what is your, uh, we will clap for you. <laughs> you know, box. One of the first things you do is what we call the non-destructive test for the structural element of the building. That okay. is to determine the structural integrity of the building. <coughs> it is very important. The test is, um, you have firms that carry that test out. It's called NDT, non-destructive structural test for the building. To identify where all the columns are, identify where all the beams are, and after you have done, you will now also be able to design and know exactly what use you are doing. Normally, you check, you actually do a fresh structural design, especially if you are doing a full building from um, residential to commercial. No, you know, what I normally tell people is that in a room that you design, a bedroom, what, how many persons do you design to stay in the bedroom? Maximum sure. is two persons. Ah. You are very generous, three. Now you want to that room to that room to an office where you want to sit at least six to seven persons, and they'll be sitting there for minimum of eight hours every day. Yeah. You know that you are increasing the load on that floor space, especially if it's a suspended floor. You need to reinforce that. If not, you will see cracks, you will see collapse, you will see you know those things will give way. So normally you you will need to do that non-destructive test to check for the structure and integrity of the building. Once you do that, you know what to do. It tells you exactly what to do. It tells you where the columns you are supposed to. You are supposed to do some additional columns. You do additional beams. If it's an old building that you can't exactly do uh, so much of concrete works, you need to also now begin to use structural steel to be able to augment for it. Where you run structural steel beam underneath the existing floor, suspended floor to carry the floor and then distribute the load down to the foundation. Now, coming to underpinning, underpinning is actually done to strengthen of an existing building. And once you are doing underpinning, you have to do either if spending the existing load into another structural element to the foundation. So the underpinning is done on the foundation of the building. You, 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 you bust open the floor, you do a new foundation and transmit the load from the upper floor down directly to the foundation. I hope that you are clear with what I've said. Yes, yes, yes. What the other, the last thing I would like to know, I saw online uh, yes. in the, in developed country, trans building movement, transferring a whole structure from one place to another. I saw it online. I would like to. Yes, know, it's very possible. Okay. Yes, it's I very possible, know. especially for um, memorial building or. Um, um, uh, there are buildings that you call monumental buildings that you don't want to demolish, but you want to relocate from its particular position. Uh, normally, the construction methodology determines how that building can move. If the building was not built properly with the proper structural elements, it will be difficult to move the building because the building will be lifted from the foundation. Let's not forget that if the building is properly done, the foundation can be lifted. You are just, uh, you are just suspending the building on top of sand. So the, the, the building will be lifted with levers. Normally, the if okay, you're in Ibadan. Um, some of the bridge uh, repair that they are doing in Lagos, especially around the Todd Mainland Bridge, uh, Marine Bridge, in Ap and all that, they did a little bit of that. You have this, um, they have some levers that they will use to suspend the bridge at a particular level, take it up, and then fill in the structural element they want to fill and allow it to come down. It's like a, you know, like this thing used for your car, this... Uh, uh, what do you jack. call it now? When you, uh, yes, like a jack. Is a is a is a levered jack that use okay. a hydraulic hydraulic jack. Hydraulic that they, jack. That's what they use. You, yes, you position it on different parts of the building and you suspend it. Those jack also have tires, so maybe okay. you suspend it. 
you do it in a, there is a particular technology you use for that to move the building from a, whatever position you, just like you are transporting it like um even some of these um, uh, bridge elements the bridge beams precast beams for uh, for bridges sometimes they move it like that you have special vehicles for that but you don't need to do that in Badona. do we want to pay for that kind of money the money to do that to, to move the building is even more expensive than they want to build a building you're right. We don't need to do it anymore. There are enough land, but I just want to flow along with the new technology. That's why I asked. Okay, that's it. That's it. It's uh, something that uh, you can, and I, I'm very conversant with that very well. And uh, Thank you, sir. Really, before you can even do that to building, you need to ensure that the building is structurally stable before you can do that. Thank okay, you. Daniel, let's hear you. A very good evening to you, sir. Uh, no. Uh, I have to appreciate you for the wonderful lectures they have uh, lectures they have delivered and delivered this evening. Uh, it's a robust one. Okay, um, you have answered most of my questions. Uh, questions I wanted to ask on um, this uh, dam uh, is a rising dam caused by capillary action. So you have yeah. answered that. And then another question I want to ask is: um, uh, Is it possible? It's not. It's not about. Uh, I okay. In the case of um, areas that are prone to dam, can in the course of casting the DPC, is it possible to add the uh, additives, uh, more like um, we call it sealant? The sealant also that is. Uh, what they call it, there is a waterproof, waterproof cement It'll be added to it. And then instead of using sharp sand, use the stone doors in place. I believe that we're also going to um, address this uh, dam proof cause, uh, dam caused by this capillary reaction. Because okay, Abuja, okay. This, this problem is, uh, is very common in Abuja here. It wouldn't even, even use the dam proof uh, leader, you still have the have have that problem coming up. Maybe after two or three years. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know that when you are doing um, um, DPC, you are placing the placement of the DPC. You also need it has its own technique. It's not just for you to put it sit in a particular manner and then it gets punctured while the uh, construction is going on. And probably they also use the, they don't use the proper gauge. That's why I specified that you should use the thousand gauge. The one that is popular in the market is the 500. You tell them it's thousand gauge. It's, once you see it, you, you, you will know. It's thick. So in most construction companies that do roads, they, they're the ones that really go and get it. If you know, if you, if you look at construction companies that do roads, they are spread it. They normally spread it um, before they do the final finish for the road, before they put the, uh, the stone base. And um, uh, yes, uh, if you use um, um, waterproof, uh, water, if you waterproof your concrete, um, okay. if you waterproof your concrete for the for the uh, floor slab, it has a way of improving that. Um, but it, it 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 doesn't take away the fact that you still need to put your DPC. It just if by the time you put your DPC and do a do your waterproof uh, concrete uh, over the as your uh, floor slab, it will now help to give you double protection. The use of stone dust. Stone dust does not exactly um, do anything to waterproof at all. The only thing is that um, if you get proper stone dust, it reduces the number of impurity that will be uh, we adding into the concrete. Normally, because if you have sharp sand, if you don't have good river wash sharp sand, you have impurities in that river that um, sharp sand. It reduces the, the effectiveness and the strength of the concrete, and thereby causing it to fail and cause um, some of these things to happen. So if you use um, stone dust, um, yeah, the stone dust, you must ensure that it's fine enough and it's, it's void of impurities, and then it will also surface. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, who else, do we have any more questions? Kinsley, do you have another question? I thought I've taken yours. <laughs> Hello, sir. No questions for now. Okay, great. Um, Hello. Yeah, me, Hello, you sir. have a yes. 
Yes, I do. I want to ask um, um, how can we treat uh, a kind of crack that is um, cyclic? You know, there are some cracks that will open up at a time and then close up at some other time. Ah, that spiritual crack, no crack opens and close up. That one is expansion. <laughs> no, apart from uh, expansion joints, there might be some cracks that uh, maybe seasonal on the wall. Exactly. Mm. That's what I'm telling you that that crack that you are seeing that is seasonal is <laughs> actually acting as an expansion joint. Okay, okay, okay. So it's better to create an expansion joint on the where the world is same. That line to ensure that it follows that line so it doesn't go more than there. Okay. okay. You see, uh, you. once building building is being constructed, then that's why you need all this understanding so that if you are privileged to be um, in, a, in a situation where you see building being construction and uh, so it being constructed. Where the, the engineers normally design expansion joints, the joints, but sometimes when the contractors are building, they forget to put it. I don't know if you understand. They forget yeah, I to do. Put uh -huh. So but, they forget. But, but for for what length of uh, of a uh, wall will an expansion joint be necessary? Is normally it that all the walls? No, not all the walls. We have a, a span. Normally, if the span for depending on the beauty, sorry, the soil type. It ranges between 30 to 40 meters span length okay. Okay. of the, the okay. soil type. Then there are some times that when you need, when you have uh, the topography of the soil is uh, quite steep and sharp. Um, by the time you are having change of levels, you have to put a, an expansion joint where you have the drop on drop in level, so that by the time the building is settling, it settles properly. So I don't have the building tearing at the point where you have uh, changing levels. Okay, thank yes. you very much. Sorry, sir. Is there any solution for a door? Like you have a part of your house that is a wooden door, and this the you know, wooden door during the rainy season it comes back. Then during dry season, because it's dry, you can't close the door properly because it's expanding or something. Okay, yeah. Um, you know what happens is that that particular door was not hmm. properly the wood that was used for that door was not properly seasoned or treated, and once okay. that happens, you will that problem except you change that door you okay. need to that's why normally the when you're when you're when you're doing door production you see yeah. um sometimes you may be privileged to be in a project where uh they are supposed to supply because the doors are not um uh, they, are, they are going to be locally pro, uh, pro, uh, produced and sometimes yeah. they produce it on the site using um hardwood or something the minimum time that you allow the door to the do to dry out is actually mm. four weeks. You must mm. allow that period where before they touch the door, before they touch the wood at all for the door, you must allow the wood sit for four weeks to dry out by itself. So that whatever expansion, whatever curve that wants to happen to it, it will happen before that time. By the time you now start planing the wood, it will actually um, begin. Normally, once you do that, once you're allowing it to, once you are allowing it to dry out, you actually also apply chemicals. Um, to the to the wood so that it soaks it in and then allows it to properly season it so that the door becomes uh, uh, it is normally immersed into this into these chemicals so that at the end of the day the wood becomes properly seasoned so that by the time you are using it it will not get to that point where we just keep expanding and going back expanding and going back so that that process would have happened and then when you fit it into the door even if it does going to expand it's just going to happen once it won't repeat itself again. Hmm. Okay. So because when you're buying the finished door, there's no sign on it on, on the body to tell you that I was finished well. Well, you know, especially if you are getting the imported doors, you you suddenly will not have that kind of problem, except you are buying doors that are that that are that are that are made from particle particle boards. Those ones, you know, that sometimes when the weather becomes when it's rainy season, water will just uh, it soaks moisture. That's why I do not like those doors personally it soaks moisture and once 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 that happens it begins the door begins to deteriorate mm -hmm. okay so any other question i was seeing on one hand just now 
I did uh, yeah I, I was I did uh, I can't see his hand anymore. Okay. Um, any further questions? All right. Um, if we don't have any further question, I think we can call it an evening. Um, I'll say thank you very much for participating in the class. And I hope um, with these few points of mine, I've been able to convince you not to confuse me. <laughs> <you. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Are you taking us in another class or the end of your field? <laughs> uh, 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 that class you're taking us. Hello, I, I think. Um, hello, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I, I just want to chip in this. Uh, uh, the, the, for that particular um, building that is not um, occupied by somebody, or you know that the building is not going to be occupied for a long time. What is the practical way of ensuring uh, uh, minimizing deterioration? Because I'm not so sure that we can actually uh, stop the deterioration. But maybe there's a way we can reduce. You can, it. you can actually can minimize it. Eh? If it's under your facility, you are managing that facility. What I would advise you to do is that make sure that you have somebody go into that apartment every day. I'm not even ah. talking about facility. I'm talking about like you, the analogy you use, the, the house at the at the village that you don't get, get to all the time. So that means you need to just get employ somebody to help you enter your house and come out. Or is there any way to simulate something like that that you look as if somebody's inside there? I'm just but, thinking. Uh, oh God, you can do maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But you just need to look for somewhere to go in. If you don't have somewhere to go in, just, just let me spend your money where you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, so you're on for Saturday too, right? Hello, Osi. Yes, sir. Yeah, on for Saturday too. I need to check the schedule. Uh, Baraka says the next class is yours as well. Thank you. Okay, no problem. I'll check it. Right. Um, uh, is this a? Are they tired? Your hand is up. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Good evening, everyone. Okay, I wanted to add to your comment on. I think the question on them um, wood, the wooden door swelling and them um, going back. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think from my little experience, I've seen it with um, MDF, MDF woods, um, like you said, particle woods, particle, particle boards, yes. when they use, yes. So I've seen it is humidity. Your network is I've discovered that when you have, F hello? Yeah, break it up. I can't Hello? look out. Can you? Am I clear now? Yes, they are clear now. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, I I discovered that when you have MDF around places that have um like bedrooms, when you have MDF around bedrooms or you have MDF in a place where you do not control humidity, it tends to swell. Yes. And that it swells because you absorb water. Yes. So that will now start giving you that um door not closing properly experience and then okay so my house we changed a door recently in my house where i stayed we, we changed the door recently it's not mdf it's actually hardwood but we, the door is an entrance door so when it rains during the rainy season you find that the door gets hard to hard to close so i think it's it's something we would when they absorb water during the rainy season and then dry season they go back to normal okay so like i just wanted I to add that Yes, uh, no, like I said, actually, you, I'm sure you didn't. You, maybe you, your connection went off. If that wood is properly seasoned, yes, it will not have that problem. Even with MDF? No, 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 no. MDF, that is MDF's problem. That is the MDF's problem. MDF must have okay. that problem. For hardwood, the hardwood, okay. once it's properly seasoned, 
it has to go through that process of seasoning. With and your the seasoning is not just for it to dry out. You use chemicals to also dry it out. Okay. Once you do that, it reduces. Not it will happen, but it won't be as as bad as bad you as. want. Hey, what you you you, you, will, you may not even know because when you are doing installation, you give tolerance for the for that level of expansion for your door. Every door that is installed. That, okay. that knows how to do it properly and once they bring the door to install it there is always a tolerance around the frame of the door to ensure that it caters for that movement okay sir yeah so once it's properly done and the wood is over you won't have that problem you won't even notice it all right thank you sir yes sir more questions please okay um Mr. Paul, I'm not sure there's any other question. So thank, thank so you so so much. I believe it was a fantastic class. This is the first class that we have questions and answers for one straight hour. <laughs> it was, of course, it was intentional. <laughs> uh, this was amazing. Well done. <laughs> Especially if the participants are following very well. The yes, yeah, yeah, taking notes. That's true. That's true. Well done. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice evening. See you on Saturday. I may not be at all in the class at all. So also you start with you at the Dali 4 and do the lessons learned from today's class and go into um, uh, the uh, class for uh, Saturday as well. And then um, if you have any uh, solutions, uh, issues you want resolved, um, uh, you know the topics Mr. Osi has handled so far. You can take him up on anyone anyway, so you can have a good time on Saturday. See you on Saturday. Bye-bye. Hello, Mr. Paul. Hello, Mr. Yes. Paul. Yes, sorry, before you uh, end the class, I want to suggest, or I don't know if you have this as, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, inculcated in the schedule. Don't you think it's necessary we have, like, midterm break? I mean, I mean, before we run uh, the... We finish the courses roughly we have a like week, a two we weeks. have a week of break before the exam. Okay. No, no, not even before the exam start. I mean, uh, like uh, if we are into almost half of the uh, half of the course, then I think we should have like a break or two breaks or no, two no, weeks. No, no, no. This, this, this is this is evening school. In evening school, you okay. don't have that public holiday or have midterm break. A, this man is a lazy man. Don't mind him. <laughs> Sir, honestly, my, 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 my work schedule is so far. So I, I just think I can have that. Uh, or we can have that so that we can revise, revise well before we even my go ahead. My dear, when you are doing fine. evening school, eh, you are doing two, two full-time jobs, your day job and your evening school work. You understand? It's just part of the discipline, no, though. It's part of the discipline okay, of the process. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. It's fine, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Redouble your yeah, effort. Thank you very much. Well, all of you will pass. Uh, okay, sir. Amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank bye -bye. you very much, sir. Bye -bye, all right. Sir. Bye. Okay. All right. Bye. Sir.